I'd like to demonstrate a technique for using types to guide the construction of functional programs. I have here a Haskell source file with three functions. The types are given, but the implementations are stubbed out. I'll try to fill in the implementations using what I know about the types, but I'll otherwise pretend I don't know what the functions are meant to do. OK, the first thing I'll do is make a new name for undefined. This isn't really necessary, but it will make things a bit more meaningful. So a hole is just something that needs to be filled in. Now let's look at Compose. We can see from the type that it takes three arguments, so let's give them names, f, g, and x. Now let's pull apart the type of Compose so we can write down the type of each argument. We'll also write down the type of the whole, which is the same as the result type of Compose, which is c. Alright, so we need something of type c, and from the arguments we see that the only way we'll get that is by applying f to something of type b. So let's replace the whole with an application of f. We don't yet have anything of type B, so we'll just make a new hole for the argument, and we'll make a note that the type of the new hole is B. Similarly, the only way we'll get something of type B is by an application of G. So let's replace this hole with an application of G. We now need a new hole for the argument to G, and so the type of this hole must be A. And finally, we already have an X of type A, so we can just use it to fill in the last hole, and we've arrived at an implementation. So you see that the technique is to write down the types of what we have, starting with what we're given as arguments, and also to write down the types of what we need, starting with the result we need to return. As in this example, we can then work backwards from what we need, filling each hole using what we have, possibly revealing new holes that we subsequently need to fill. As we'll see shortly, we can also work forwards, constructing new things from what we have, with the aim of eventually constructing something that will fill a hole. But I'm not really happy with the way we've gone about this. For one thing, our type assertions are just comments, and they're not checked, so a mistake will lead to wasted effort. Secondly, it might be awkward to track the types of multiple holes. And finally, we have to work out the types ourselves, when we know that the compiler ought to be able to do that for us. So let's start again, but this time we'll write our assertions so they can be checked by the compiler. For the arguments, we'll add a WHERE clause with a set of dummy bindings. Visually, this is similar to the comments we wrote before, but now the types can be checked. In case it's not clear what's going on here, we're just taking each argument to the function and binding its value to a wildcard pattern within the scope of a WHERE clause. The wildcard pattern ensures that we don't actually create any new names, so we can't change the meaning of the program, but the type annotations will be checked. As it is, the compiler won't accept this because in plain Haskell, type variables in the function signature are not scoped over the function definition. So the A's, B's and C's in our assertions are not recognised as the A's, B's and C's in the signature. We can fix that by turning on a language extension called scoped type variables. Now we also need to write an explicit for all to mark the scope to which we want the type variables bound. OK, so that type checks, and now we can see that if we make a mistake in one of our annotations, for example here, we get a type error that tells us not only the location of the error, but what the type should have been, in this case A rather than B. Let's look at the whole. Rather than work out the type of the whole myself, I'd like the compiler to tell me. I can get it to do that by provoking a type error. To systematically provoke type errors, we just need a value of a concrete type that is different from every type we might use in our programs. So let's just make a type and a corresponding data constructor, both called whole, with a capital H. Now we have two varieties of whole. I'll call the uppercase variety a noisy whole, since it will always provoke a type error, and I'll call the lowercase variety a silent whole, since it will always be accepted anywhere. The idea is that if we have several holes, we'll use only one noisy hole at a time and leave the rest as silent holes. That way, when we're looking at an error message provoked by a noisy hole, we don't have to think about which hole caused that error. OK, let's make this hole noisy. If we look below, the error message tells us that GHC was expecting a C instead of a hole. Using the same reasoning as before, we replaced the hole with an application of F, and now the compiler tells us that the new hole needs to be filled with a B. So we replaced that with an application of G, and now the new hole needs to be filled with an A. And finally, we can satisfy that with an X. Now because the noisy hole is a type as well as a value, we can also use it in type contexts. For example, if we weren't sure of the type of X while writing assertions about the arguments, we can just use a noisy hole to ask the compiler. So this error message tells us that the hole should have been an A. OK, now that we're done, we can remove the superfluous dummy bindings. And since we're no longer referring to the type variables in the body of the function, we can also remove the for all binders. OK, so much for Compose. Let's move on to a slightly more interesting example. 
In the type of apply, we see that the variable m stands for a type constructor, and we can further see that it is constrained to the type constructor class monad. The constraint means that we know more about m than if it were unconstrained, and in particular we know that we can, and indeed probably have to, make use of the methods of the monad type constructor class in our implementation. So, proceeding as before, we see from the type that apply takes two arguments, so we'll name them mf and ma. We'll write assertions for the types of the arguments. And of course we need to remember to explicitly bind the type variables in the signature. OK, so that compiles now. But remember that if we weren't sure of the type of an argument, we can use a noisy hole to ask the compiler. Here it's telling us that it was expecting mf to have the type m of a to b. Looking back at the implementation, if we make a hole noisy, we see that we need to construct something of type mb. Clearly we can't do that with the simple application of what we have, so we're going to have to make use of the fact that m is a monad. Now, if we need to remind ourselves of the type of any function or method we want to use, we could use a GHCI query, or alternatively, we could use a dummy binding. In particular, we can use a dummy binding to check whether we can specialise any variables in the type of the function to the particular types that we want to use. For example, if we add a dummy binding for the monadic bind operator, we can use a noisy hole to ask for its type. For reasons I don't quite understand, GHC doesn't tell us the full story, but it's enough to get us by. Notice that the error uses fresh type variables, m0, a0, and b0. These are universally quantified, which means we should be able to instantiate them to anything we like. Since we want to construct an mb, it seems likely that we'll want the bind operator to return mb as well. So we might as well specialise by instantiating m0 and b0 with m and b respectively. But since I'm not yet sure what a0 will be, I'll leave that polymorphic for now, and in fact, I'll write an explicit for all to make this clear and I'll rename a0 to h to avoid any confusion with the type variable a. This now passes the type checker, which means that this is a valid partial specialization. So now we have two choices for applying the bind operator, mf and ma. If we want to, we can use dummy bindings to explore the resulting types. For example, if we partially apply bind to mf, this will swallow the first parameter. Since this will also instantiate the type variable h, we can use a noisy hole to find out its type. And, of course, we can do the same for a partial application of bind to MA. OK, back to the implementation. Without anything else to tell us which argument to bind first, we'll just follow convention and bind the leftmost argument first. So we replace our hole with MF bound to a new hole. We see that the new hole requires a function of one argument, and in order to make assertions about the type of the argument, we need a name and a scope to write those assertions, which means we also need to name the function. So we'll name the function k and its argument f, and we'll use a silent hole for the result of k while we're dealing with assertions about the type of f. Writing the assertion, we find that f has type a to b. Now, switching to a noisy hole for the result of k, we see that again we need to construct an mb, and we still have no way to do this with a simple application of what we have, so we turn to the monadic bind operator, this time on ma. Again, the new hole requires a function of a single argument, so we'll name the function r and the argument x, and we'll write an assertion for the type of x, using a noisy hole to ask for the type. This time the form of the error message is different, but the interpretation is the same. We need an a in place of the hole. Returning to the result of the function r, we see that GHC is expecting something of type mb0, where b0 is a fresh type variable, which implies it is universally quantified. In this case, it appears that GHC has generalised the type as expecting of R. Although it's not clear to me exactly when GHC will perform this generalisation, to see that it's reasonable for it to do so, consider that if R is polymorphic enough to allow any type B0, then clearly it can allow the specific type B. The problem is that we don't want to implement such a polymorphic R. In fact, in this case, that would be impossible. Instead, we want to implement the most specific type we can, because that is likely to be easier than implementing a more general type. So if we're not sure what the specific type should be, how can we find out from the compiler? The trick is to move the noisy hole to the relevant place in the type annotation, and then GHC is happy to tell us that we merely need a B in place of the hole. Now, we still have no way to directly construct something of type MB, but we do have an F of type A to B and an X of type A. So we can construct f of x and use an assertion to check its type. 
Finally, to get from a B to an MB, we once again need to make use of the fact that M is a monad. If we want, we can use a dummy binding to check that we can make a suitable specialization of the type of return, and then we can check that return of f of x has the right type, and since it does, we can fill our last hole. Things have become a little messy, so let's back substitute. Here, k becomes lambda f to ma bound to r, but since r is not in scope here, we immediately substitute lambda x to return of f of x. We no longer need the dummy bindings, nor do we need the explicit binders for the type variables in the signature. So at this point we could convert this to denotation, or simplify using lift-m, or both, but I'll leave that for another time. Instead, if you're not already exhausted, let's do one final example. Here we'll see that when we encounter concrete types and type constructors, we typically have to make more choices about our implementation. OK, we can see from the type that filter-m takes two arguments. Let's name them P and X's, and as usual, let's write assertions about their types. And let's not forget to write explicit binders for the type variables. Now I'm pretty sure I already know the type of the whole, so I'll just write that in there. Again, we can't construct an M of list of A by simple application of what we have, nor do we have any monadic value to bind. But we do have a list of A, so we could either pattern match on X's, or apply some list function to it. But which list function would we apply? There are many list functions, so it's not an easy question to answer. But since list is a recursive structure, the most useful solution is likely to involve recursion over x's. And the right fold function, foldr, captures the most general recursion scheme over lists. So let's replace the hole with an application of foldr to x's, leaving two new holes for the remaining arguments. The second of these arguments corresponds to the base case for the recursion. In other words, it's the result when x's is empty. And indeed, using a noisy hole, we see that it must have type m of list of a. As in the previous example, we can use return to construct one of those from a list of a, and the only list of a we can construct out of thin air is the empty list. So we should be able to replace this hole with return of the empty list. Now looking at the other hole, we can see that GHC has again generalized the type a little more than we'd like. But we can at least see that we need a function of two arguments. So let's name the function f, and its arguments x and r. And let's write an assertion to find out the type of x, which is a. Similarly, we find that the type of r is m of list of a. Next, we look at the type of the result of f, which we see should also be m of list of a. Obviously, we could satisfy the types by simply returning r, but that gives a trivial solution which is not useful. Instead, we notice that we haven't yet used the argument p, which is a function from a to m of bool. Since we have an x of type a, we can apply p to x to get an m of bool, and since m is a monad, we can bind the result to a new hole. Now we see that the new hole requires a function of one argument, so we name it k, and its argument c, and we use an assertion to find that the type of c is bool. Looking back at the type of the result of k, we see that ghc generalizes the type, so we use the usual trick to get a more specific type for b0, and that turns out to be list of a. Now to get a non-trivial result, we should really do something with c. Since c is a bool, the natural thing to do is branch. So let's replace the hole with a branch on c. This gives us two new holes, one for each branch. Now we just need to come up with two meaningfully different ways to construct an m of list of a from x and r. There are many ways to do this, but the one that seems most meaningful is the one which relates each condition C most directly to the X which produced it. So therefore, we'll use X if and only if the condition C is true. In the false case, we'll just return R. Now in the true case, we want to combine X and R. If we had a little experience with monads, we might recognize that liftm would do the job, like this. But suppose we don't see that then our only real option is to bind r, which is a monadic value, to a new hole. The new hole requires a function, so we name it j, and name its argument y's, which dhc tells us should have type list of a. When we try to discover the type of the result of j, we run into a new problem. Previously we've only seen overgeneralized type variables, but this time dhc has given us an overgeneralized type constructor variable, m0. Our usual trick to discover a more specific type won't work, because hole has the wrong kind. We just get a kind error which doesn't tell us anything about the types. But we can introduce a hole constructor with the right kind. 
Let's call it whole one and notice that it takes a type argument. Then when we try to set the result type of j to whole one whole, GHC tells us first that it expected m instead of whole one, and then list of a instead of whole. Okay, now that we have x and y's, we can combine them to make a new list. And then we can use the monadic return to construct the value of the right type. Since that fills our last hole, and since we've used all of the arguments to filter M in a meaningful way, we've arrived at a non-trivial and hopefully useful implementation. In fact, this implementation is equivalent to filter M in the standard library. Now let's just clean up by back substituting K, and then J, and then removing superfluous dummy bindings for all binders and type annotations. Finally, we can disable the scope type variables extension and remove the whole definitions to make absolutely sure there's nothing left to fill in. And then we're done. To summarize, we've seen an approach for using types to guide the construction of functional programs, which consists of writing down the types of what we have and the types of what we need, and systematically joining the dots in between. We've also seen some tricks for getting some help from GHC. But don't confuse the tricks with the underlying approach. The underlying approach is timeless and in fact comes from mathematical logic where it's called natural deduction. The tricks are only really applicable to current versions of GHC as of early 2013. In fact, sometime in the next few months we expect a release of GHC which is likely to include a new extension called type holes, which will make development in the natural deduction style considerably smoother.